Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners, grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a Bible study that uh, our uh, churches just recently went through talking about some biblical wisdom for practicing politics. Uh, I think most uh, Americans can give a long list of uh, problems uh, and specifically sins uh, associated with how we practice politics. Um, there's a lot of quite a lot of lies and deception going on, quite a lot of um, uh, hypocrisy. You see both sides are, well, all all sides, I suppose, uh, depending how you divide things up, uh, hyper fixating on the shortcomings of the other side while ignoring their own sins and corruption, right? Um, we see a lot of people um, or a lot of evil persisting in our government uh, that really needs to be addressed and it's just kind of not. Uh, so there, there's a whole lot of problems. And even just when it comes to a, a simple uh, two people talking to each other, uh, trying to explain what they believe and why they believe it, even there. Uh, those uh, discussions often end with all kinds of uh, uh, slander and anger and these kinds of things. It's very often not very productive at all. Uh, so today we want to ask, well, how does God want us to practice politics? Uh, does God want us to practice politics? Maybe we should avoid voting, right? Uh, what does the Bible actually say about these things? Um this, that, this is the uh, goal for this study here. Um, and so as we go to the scriptures, we do find that God certainly does want us to seek the good of those around us. Uh, that includes uh, not only our family and friends, but also it broadens out to our neighborhood, to our city, and also to our nation. Uh, so let's uh, look to the scriptures and find some biblical wisdom for uh, just some ways that we can be thinking uh, as we enact or act out politics, uh, as we engage in uh, pursuing the good of our city, uh, the good of our nation. Uh, the first place I want to take you is just uh, thinking through our right priorities. Uh, I find that one of the great problems regarding politics, at least from a spiritual standpoint, is that many people make politics their religion. Uh, you'll often hear uh, political uh, uh, speakers use religious terms uh, in the way that they talk, right? They say this is not, uh, you know, two different sides trying to decide how to, how best to move the country forward. They say it's good and e good versus evil, right? Uh, this is God versus Satan, right? Uh, people will say that this candidate is God's chosen uh, one or, or things like that, right? People will even, uh, many Christians I find, will think about uh, a um, upcoming presidential candidate as the new Messiah. Uh, not, not necessarily that they would say that out loud explicitly, but they are, are sort of waiting for uh, this savior to come and change their lives rather than putting their hope alone in Jesus Christ. Um, so the first thing we want to think through is what are the right priorities uh, that we ought to have? Uh, where does politics land as far as the things that you need to be focusing on in your life? Uh, and the first place I want to take you is a very interesting reading from uh, Luke chapter 13. Uh, there it says, um, or this is verse one. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. I find this to be a really applicable lesson for us today. Uh, we live in an outrage uh, culture in a lot of ways, right? Uh, online algorithms uh, and uh, news uh, outlets, uh, as they figure out what are the best stories to get as many people reading their uh, news stories, what they have found is statistically, people are much more likely to read and engage with stories that make them infuriated. Uh, so there is a huge monetary and economic incentive uh, for social media and uh, news outlets to put outrageous content in front of you. Uh, they just make a lot more money doing that. They get a lot more retention. They get a lot more uh, people looking at their stuff so that they can uh, show you more advertisements and, again, make more money. Uh, the reality is uh, you and I, if, if we see a nice story about, you know, some kids helping out a local uh, elderly per person or something, uh, generally, uh, we just don't respond to that. We'll, we'll smile, right? We'll be happy, but we won't necessarily leave the comment. We won't necessarily read all the way through the story type thing. Um, and so we have to be on, on guard against this. And a lot of political discussion tends to be these outrageous stories, right? Uh, it's these over the top, look at this horrible thing that's happened. Now look at how Jesus responds to an outrageous story in his day. 
right? Um, again, Pilate, uh, Jesus would eventually die under Pilate, right? Uh, Pontius Pilate had killed some Galileans and he had mixed their blood with their sacrifices. Uh, a, a modern day equivalent would be like if a governor in our country um, killed some Christians and then poured their blood into the communion wine, right? This would be an outrage. This would be horrific. This would be, you know, big news, right? Um, but notice Jesus' response to this. Uh, he doesn't start screaming about how horrible uh, Pontius Pilate is, just even though he absolutely was <laughs> horrendously evil. Um, Jesus instead focuses us on what matters, right? Unless you repent, you also will perish. Uh, and this is a really important thing for us to think through. What is uh, the, the first priority for you and I uh, in our lives? Um, like I said, many people make uh, make uh, politics into their religion. They make this the most important thing. Uh, but uh, if I'm not taking care of my uh, spiritual health, if I'm not taking care of my mental or my physical health, if my uh, job or my financial situation is falling apart, if I'm not uh, being a good neighbor to my family, to my friends, to my own community, right, uh, to, to be talking about world politics or national politics, uh, it, it's really out of order, right? Uh, it, I'm I'm focusing too much on something that I, I really should not, uh, it, especially if other parts of my life are falling apart. Uh, and so here again, Jesus reminds us that there is a priority uh, for how your life is supposed to work. Uh, and so we want to be focusing on the main things. Uh, focus your life on the important things. Uh, and we'll get a little bit more to the, um, or we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on here as well. Uh, another fascinating passage Um to consider is Deuteronomy chapter six. Uh, this is verses nine, uh, six through nine. Uh, this is the second giving of the law. So Moses is writing about all the laws that God gave uh, to the Israelites. Uh, and, he, and he says these words, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, so here again, uh, God wants us to really have a, a, a huge fixation on his word. He wants us thinking about these things. He wants uh, the, the words of God to be uh, permeating, flooding, inundating our lives, right? Uh, that we are so full of, our, of God's word that God's word comes out in these various aspects of our lives, right? And here's a place, once again, as we think about priorities, uh, I find there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who their minds are filled with politics, right? Uh, but they know very little of God's word. Uh, if if uh, your life is, I spend an hour a week listening to God speak, uh, and then the rest of the hours of my life are listening to, you know, my favorite politician, you know, again, there's there's a mismatch there. Right there, there is a there. There's too much going into that political realm. Uh, again, if you're if if that's your job, maybe that makes more sense. But uh, for the most part, uh, that that's out of balance. Uh, also, notice how God wants us to change with these things. Uh, this also kind of uh, bleeds into um, how we think about political discussion, political activism. Um, notice here, he says that the commands of God should be on our hearts. Uh, they should be so filling our hearts. Uh, again, notice we're talking about them all the time, whether we're at home, whether we're out and walking. Uh, and he says to tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Again, very interesting that as God's word is filling their hearts, uh, then it's going to fill their minds, right? They're, they're writing it on their foreheads as in they're thinking about this all the time, right? Uh, and then also it's on their hands, right? It's filling their actions. God's word uh, is coming out in what they think, what they say, what they do. And then as uh, from there in verse nine, uh, they're writing these uh, things on their door frames. So as they, the individual is so filled with God's word uh, that they are living it, talking it, acting it out, uh, now it's filling their household. Uh, so that God's word is all over their household, right? Uh, and then finally, last is on the gates of the city, okay? Uh, so again, there's a, a little bit of a projection here uh, uh, or a trajectory here for uh, where truth uh, starts and where it ends up, right? So truth has to first start in my heart, right? Then it comes out in my actions and my life and my thoughts, words, right? Then it fills uh, those people around me right? As I am sharing it uh, with my, with those people that are close to me, and then it can broaden out uh, from there to the city, uh, to from to the group around me, uh, the wider group around me. Uh, very much this is uh, generally where your sphere, sphere of influence is going to go, 
right? Uh, so you need to know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> uh, and then as you're uh, living that out, uh, that's going to allow you then to speak to more people. Uh, and so again, very interesting just trajectory as far as thinking about uh, where do these things start? Um, and once again, the word of God ought to really be our priority above uh, all of these other things. Um, again, I could use this uh, Bible study to try and convince all of you to vote the way I would like you to vote. That'd be wonderful for me, maybe. <laughs> uh, depending on how well I actually understand things. Uh, but here again, there's there's a much greater priority for us understanding God's wisdom for these things, right? Uh, and so this is uh, what I wanted to get in front of us to start off is that we have the right priorities. Um, next, I, want us to, uh, I wanted to um, have us think through the idea of orders of creation. And basically what I mean by this is that uh, God has designed his world, his universe, his creation uh, to function in a certain way. And uh, in, to not function in other ways, right? Uh, so again, uh, a bird can jump off the roof of uh, my my house and uh, can fly no problem. If I jump off the roof of my house, flapping my arms, that I'm, I'm going to have problems, right? Uh, I am not designed to function that way, right? Um, and so in the same way, we want, or the better we understand how God has designed his universe to function, the more wisely we are going to be able to live. Um, so as we're talking about politics, we want to remember what is the purpose for which God has designed government. Um, if we are ascribing to government powers that God never gave it, if we are hoping that government is going to accomplish something that it's not designed to, we're going to fall flat. We're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, psalm 2 is just a really cool psalm. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, uh, verses 1 through 8. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and they're and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill or my holy mountain. Uh, old translation, sorry. I will uh, proclaim the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Uh, ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Uh, this is just a, I, I think find this to be a fascinating psalm, but notice again, right? Uh, you have all the nations of the world that are plotting against God. They're trying to overthrow his power. They're trying to throw off his design for how the universe is to function, right? Uh, and God just laughs at it. Uh, this is again, something for us to remember that God is ultimately in control of the events of the world. Uh, a lot of people are ascribe way too much uh, agency uh, to the powers that be, to the um, uh, to the worldly powers, I should say, to earthly governments. Um, ultimately, God is in control of all things. Uh, if you if you have gone through Bible history, we just did that recently. Uh, you hear about these great, vast nations like Assyria and Babylon that rose up. Uh, the Greeks also might fit in there too. and They don't appear so much uh, in the Bible, but they are recorded there as well. Um, but these massive nations that rose up and conquered huge swaths of the world. Uh, and where are they today? They're just gone, right? These, these great powerful empires rose up and then they faded away and uh, mostly dis or many of them just disappeared from history, right? Uh, and this is again, something for us to think about for as powerful as uh, some nation may seem today uh, from a historical standpoint uh, that, we're, we're in this for a long haul, right? Uh, and so our, our situation, again, yeah, it can be serious, uh, but we want to remember who ultimately is in control. God is in charge of the rise and fall of nations. Um, next passage for us to think through here is uh, Matthew 22. Uh, Jesus, uh, again, he was asked about uh, taxes, but Jesus said some profound words here. He says, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Notice again, uh, Jesus, uh, in these words, he's saying there are certain things that are or that do belong to the government. Again, there are certain things that God has designed the government and politics to accomplish. Uh, but there are certain things that belong only to God, uh, that those things belong to him. Uh, once again, this was a rather profound thought in uh, Jesus' day. Uh, the emperor was worshipped as a god, right? Uh, so being a citizen, uh, there was a bit of idolatry built right into that government system. Uh, here, Jesus says, no, there's a distinction between the worldly powers and God's powers. Uh, and so therefore, uh, there are certain aspects of your life that belong to uh, whatever nation you are a part of, but there are also aspects of your life that only belong to God, uh, that, that go beyond what uh, the worldly government is able to do. Uh, the next passage I wanted to take us to is, um, notice the here Jesus is describing the goal and 
tools of the church. Uh, and we're going to distinguish that from uh, the government in uh, Romans 13. Uh, so starting with Matthew 28 here, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, so here again, Jesus, Jesus asserts he does have all power, rule, and authority. He is in charge of all things, right? He is the great king over all things. Uh, and what job has he given to his church? To make disciples. Uh, Jesus is going, uh, has uh, tasked us with making disciples, making followers of Christ. Uh, and this is how God is making good people in the world. Again, very, very many people think the job of the government is to make good people. It's not. Uh, that's the job of God. Uh, and he does that as his church uses the tools given us. What tools has he given us? Again, he's given us uh, the word and the sacraments, right? He says, make disciples by baptizing and by teaching, right? Um, and so this is the, the job of the church. Uh, to spread the word of God, and that word of God is making disciples of Jesus. Now contrast that with the goal and tools of uh, the government. In Romans 13, it says, let, every, uh, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Uh, so again, reading, reading this section, notice specifically what is the goal of government. Uh, here he specifically says to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Um, but it, a more generalized understanding of what's being said there is that uh, those who do wrong, again, they fear punishment, uh, and so they avoid doing that crime. Uh, basically, uh, a government is going to want a stable society, right? Because a government is going to be able to stay in charge much longer if uh, society is relatively stable, okay? Uh, if uh, things get if things devolve into chaos, that government's not going to be in power very long. Uh, and so the government has the goal of creating a stable society. They want to uh, force outward compliance to a certain set of rules uh, so that things can be relatively stable. And again, what power do they have? What tool do they have to accomplish that? They have the sword. Uh, they have violent force to, uh, to accomplish that. Okay. Uh, so once again, notice the different uh, things that God has attacked or ha God has created here. Okay. These different institutions. The church is about making disciples for Christ. Uh, and we work on people's hearts and minds through word and sacrament. Contrast that with the government. The government wants a stable society. They don't necessarily care if you're a good person. They just want you to act in the right way. Okay. So they are fine with outward compliance. God doesn't want outward compliance uh, without an inward change. Right, God wants obedience from the heart. Right, uh, He wants to transform our hearts and minds. Whereas the government, they just want you to do the thing. Do, they want you to go through the motions. Right, just do the right things that they want. Right, uh, and they can use force to do that. Again, the church could uh, try to use violent force to make people believe in Jesus. Wouldn't work. Right, uh, violent force can only make outward actions. Right, it can't actually make a change of heart. Right. And so this is where uh, we see these different goals between these two different institutions, uh, and we see different tools available to them for accomplishing these things. Once again, this is all part of just understanding God's design for what government is there to do, what it actually can accomplish. And the better we understand uh, what, the, uh, what God has designed government to do, uh, the more wise we are going to be as we aim to uh, accomplish our political goals, right? What is the purpose of these things? Um, and also, also, again, going back to that, uh, what we talked about with priorities before, right? Um, as we think about God's design for our lives, many people, um, look to politics as a way to try and improve life, right? They want to make the world a better place. Uh, however, once again, as we think about God's design for your life, uh, you're going to find that you will have much more impact. Uh, you'll accomplish much more, uh, life improvement, if you start in those places where I mentioned before, right? If you first prioritize your uh, mental health, your soul, your spiritual health, your uh, body health, your uh, uh, work life, uh, your finances, uh, your family, your friends, your congregation, your neighborhood, right? Uh, if you first prioritize those things, first off, you're going to have way more of an impact 
you simply have way more control, way more responsibility in those areas, uh, much more ability to accomplish those things. Uh, and secondly, if you have all those things figured out that you can be strong in all those areas, uh, then you're going to have significantly more influence. You're going to have significantly more power to actually change things on a broader scale, right? Uh, so once again, these, this is all just how God has designed his universe to function. Uh, and so when, when we do things in the right order, we simply are, are able to get much better results. Um, I know I know a lot of people that uh, they can tell me everything about how the whole world should function, right? They, if they were in power, they would be able to run the whole world perfectly, uh, but their own lives are in shambles, <laughs> right? Uh, their, their, you know, health is a disaster, right? Uh, they don't have good relationships with anybody they know, right? Uh, and so that makes me a little doubtful whether or not they would actually be able to run the world well. Right. Uh, again, if we if we focus first on those areas of influence, those areas of responsibility that God has given us, um, uh, again, we, we can have much better results uh, going forward there. Um, one last thing uh, to think about as we, uh, again, are talking about God's design. Uh, we also, as Christians, want to understand the difference between Christianity and patriotism. OK, um, uh, the the kingdom of God is not the same as our nation. Um, and so we also want to recognize that success for God's kingdom is not necessarily success for the United States of America. Um, so a couple of examples that we've seen throughout history, uh, God can actually bring a lot of people to faith through the fall of a nation or through uh, tyranny in that nation. Uh, conversely, Satan uh, can use prosperity to lead a lot of Christians into a lukewarm faith and ultimately away from Christ. Right. Uh, so, again, there, there is a place where we have to have these things distinct in our minds. Um, we already talked about uh, outward compliance versus inward obedience, right? Um, but there, there's another uh, aspect here that if we, even if we did um, uh, perfectly uh, set up a system of laws that was totally biblical, that wouldn't necessarily make a single disciple of Christ, right? Once again, there's that difference between outward compliance uh, and that inward reality. Um, there was an, a fascinating quote. I think it was Ron Paul. Um, he was saying that uh, abortion should not be illegal. It should be unthinkable. Um, and there's a very interesting dynamic there, right? Um, there's, there's a difference between making a law saying, well, you can't do this. Um, and, and then there's the other aspect of just as a culture, we say, well, that's wrong. I'm not going to do it, right? And so again, being able to have that distinction in our minds is, is a valuable thing as we consider uh, what is the place of politics. Now, once again, that's... Um, you know, there's, there's some problems with that argument, right? We could say, well, uh, murder shouldn't be illegal. It should be unthinkable. Uh, it's probably good for us to have laws against murder, right? Uh, so again, th there are complicated things to think through there, uh, but we do want to have that idea in our heads that outward compliance is not necessarily um, somebody doing what God wants, is not necessarily God-pleasing. We want to have that distinction in our minds. Um, and at the same time, there can be value in a pushing people to do the right thing on the outside uh, that does yield good for my neighbors. So again, these are our balances that we have to maintain. All right. Um, next section I wanted to go to here is uh, the Christian duties that God gives us regarding politics. Um, Jeremiah 29 is a fascinating read here. Uh, this is as uh, God is um, allowing the Babylonians to conquer Israel uh, and take them away from their homeland and force them to live off in exile far away. Uh, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those who I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And notice too, this is in the con it is in this context that we find those uh, well-known uh, words from Jeremiah. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Uh, the Israelites, uh, again, they had been forced into exile. The godless Babylonians, this pagan empire, had just slaughtered a whole bunch of God's people, a whole bunch of the Israelites, uh, and now he was carrying them off uh, to live in this faraway land where they would be far away from uh, from their homeland, uh, from the uh, where the Temple Mount was, right? Uh, again, temple worship was such a big deal for the Israelites. Uh, and now here, uh, God is telling the Israelites to seek the prosperity of this godless city that they are now going into. That's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, especially maybe for you and I today, as we think about the evils, uh, the the evils in our own government, right? Uh, God does want us to seek the prosperity of the uh, place in which we live. That's kind of tough. That's kind of difficult, right? Uh, how can how can we do that? Why would we want to see uh, evil prosper? Uh, here again, we do want to recognize, right, that ultimately the greatest prosperity is going to come to uh, this or come through the spread of Christianity, right? Uh, the, the prosperity of salvation is ultimately what we want to see, right? Uh, so we certainly want to be praying for the spread of Christ uh, throughout uh, any nation, uh, and especially an evil nation. Uh, pray that they might repent uh, and that they might come to faith in Christ and then and then turn and do what is right, yeah? Uh, but yes, wherever God has placed you, uh, God does want you to um, live in a way that does glorify him. Uh, and part of that is seek the good, seeking the good of those around you, Uh uh, broadening out to the city in which you live and the nation in which you're a part of, right? Uh, these are good things for us to consider and think through. Uh, now, one interesting dynamic, uh, Romans 13, we went through this a little bit here. Uh, again, the Apostle Paul telling us everyone should be uh, subject to the governing authorities. Uh, I'm not going to read this one just for the sake of time. Uh, you can pause and check that out if you want. Second Timothy 2, uh, again, the Apostle Paul telling us that we should be praying for uh, those rulers that are over us. Uh, here, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, once again, submit yourselves to, uh, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority. Uh, this is very interesting, okay? I just said, uh, again, the Israelites in, um, uh, the Israelites uh, there, they are being uh, cast off into uh, exile under this godless uh, Babylonian empire that slaughtered a bunch of Israelites. Uh, Peter and Paul, uh, they're both telling people to submit to the authorities. And Peter and Paul were under the Roman government. Once again, they practiced worship of uh, the Caesar, worship of the emperor. Um, and, uh, so, and, and also, in addition to that, uh, both Peter and Paul were uh, put to death by the Roman emperor, emperor uh, the Roman empire, right? Uh, but despite those evil governments under which they lived, uh, they still encouraged people to submit uh, to those governing authorities, to pay them whatever taxes they owe and to pray for them. Okay. Uh, here again, uh, we want to have a distinction in our minds. Um, uh, God intends great good for us through authority. Okay. Um, one fascinating statistic, you can look this up, um, but uh, statistically, children that grow up with evil parents, with bad parents, uh, statistically, they tend to fare much better in a lot of different avenues in life, uh, grades, uh, substance abuse, um, uh, uh, criminal activity, things like that. Uh, kids with bad parents tend to do significantly better in a lot of different metrics than do kids who grow up with no parents. It's a very interesting thought, right? Um, and, and one of the concepts that we get out of those statistics is that there is something valuable about authority, even if it's evil, even if it's bad. There is something valuable about authority. It gives us uh, stability in life. It gives us uh, um, something to grow towards, right? It gives us something that we can actually, a foundation on which we can live. Whereas if we don't have authority, it's really just total chaos, right? So there is something valuable to having authorities in our lives. Um, and this is what we want to recognize. Even under an, an uh, evil authority, uh, we want to recognize that God does still intend good for us uh, through those authorities, okay? And so we we don't necessarily, uh, we can't always respect necessarily the uh, person in office, right? Uh, but uh, we do want to be able to recognize that God does intend good for me through that person in office. Uh, so we want to respect uh, that office, uh, regardless of who is in it, right? Um, and along with this, uh, some uh, other difficulties as far as uh, how the uh, scriptures speak about authorities um, in our day today, right? There are um, some very interesting differences for us to consider. Uh, again, like I said before, uh, many of them lived under an empire with an absolute authority uh, over them, uh, whereas you and I today, uh, are in America at least, we have um, a very different system. We have a constitutional republic, right? We have a lot of rights uh, and responsibilities that uh, are very different from what they had uh, in, the, in that culture back then. So that that's something that's very interesting for us to be able to think through and understand. Uh, again, we have a lot of checks and balances. We don't have an absolute authority. Um, like those emperors did or like empires did. Yeah. So again, very interesting things for us to be thinking through and wrestling with chewing on. Um, once again, this is a, a difficult thing for us to think about because uh, America was birthed out of rebelling against our authority. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so, so we have a, a really soft spot in our heart for rebellion, uh, for rebelling against our authorities. Uh, but as, as Christians, uh, we want to recognize that no, there is, there is something good to authority uh, just by itself, uh, by that reality. 
Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we have to, um, to blindly uh, obey tyrants uh, or, or these kinds of things. And um, we'll get to that in the next section as we talk through some uh, warnings about government. Uh, but if God has placed an evil or godless uh, nation over you, uh, know that God intends uh, good for you through that, right? Know that God will punish the evil in the end uh, and know that God will bless you through it. Uh, so make sure that you are pursuing that godly way of life that uh, that that has been, uh, that God is uh, calling you to live. <laughs> Um, going on, uh, some biblical warnings regarding politics. Uh, Revelation is maybe not the clearest place to go, uh, but I find this to be a, a helpful passage. Uh, this is speaking about one of the beasts that you find in Revelation. Um, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Uh, aside from the uh, rather difficult <laughs> things to uh, interpret in Revelation, notice that this beast is using violent force and economic uh, factors in order to force people away from worshiping God. Okay. Uh, we just said that a violent force is the tool of the government, right? Uh, and so again, this is something that we see throughout history. Uh, we've seen a lot of places where the government has used violent force uh, to persecute Christians, uh, to try and force people away from faith in Jesus. Uh, and then we also see a lot of governments using uh, economic factors uh, to push people away from Jesus. Uh, today, in fact, uh, a lot of Christians... Um, are suffering both of these, um, especially in the Middle East, you find a lot of violent persecution against Christians. Um, so be praying for your fellow Christians that are uh, facing martyrdom uh, uh, regularly, even in our day and age. Um, but in the United States, we more see people uh, falling to those uh, more economic factors, right? Um, Christians will kind of compromise on their um, religious convictions because uh, they can make more money if they do. Right. Uh, this this tends to be much more of a um, a push for us today where we are uh, for the sake of making money, for the sake of having a more comfortable lifestyle or uh, cost of or standard of living. Um, people will uh, not be faithful to God like they know they should. Um, and so this is, again, something for us to be on guard against. Uh, we should we should expect uh, that government will at certain points overstep its bounds, overstep that design that God has made for a government, uh, and they will try to uh, force things that are that is outside of their realm. Uh, so we should be on guard against that. We should be aware of that, right? Um, a number of uh, um, governments throughout history um, have uh, tried to do away with uh, with religion altogether because those governments wanted themselves to be the ultimate authority. Uh, they didn't like the idea that God was over over them. Right. So, again, this this can happen in history. Uh, so we want to be aware of that. We want to be on guard against that. This is where we come to uh, Acts chapter five. Uh, the apostles, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Um, so when a government does uh, step beyond its design uh, and, uh, for example, commands us to do something that is against God's will, uh, we have to obey God rather than men. Right. Once again, uh, God never promises that we're going to have a bunch of godly authorities over us. Uh, he does promise to bless us through authorities, uh, but he doesn't doesn't necessarily promise you that you're going to have uh, perfect uh, authorities over you. Right. Uh, you can't really expect that. Uh, and so when those authorities do overstep their bounds, uh, overstep their limits, uh, when they want to take things that belong to God alone, like your heart and mind. Right. Uh, you can't let them do that. Uh, God has to uh, God has to be the one who holds our hearts and minds. Right. Uh, our ultimate obedience belongs to God. <laughs> uh, to close out this uh, study here, I thought it'd be valuable just to go through some general wisdom uh, for practicing politics. Um, first thing for us to just be aware of, um, if you're going to get into politics, know that there's going to be a lot of fools. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, across the board. This is not just for politics. Uh, there's a whole lot of fools. Jude chapter 10 had a, has an interesting way of saying it. Uh, yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct as irrational animals do will destroy them. Uh, again, this idea of making fun of things that you don't understand, right? There's definitely a lot of that in our day and age, uh, kind of across the board, uh, having to do with all kinds of different areas of life. Um, but especially in politics, you'll notice this. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, there's a rather a nasty comedian, but uh, I, he's got some interesting insights, uh, George Carlin. But he uh, he said at one point, or I think it was him, and I might be wrong on the quote, but uh, he said, uh, 
think about how smart the average person is and then realize that half the people are dumber than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, kind of a funny, funny way of saying it, but yes, I recognize, yeah, there's going to be a lot of fools. Um, don't, don't think that, uh, there aren't fools, right? Be aware of that. Um, and uh, as you do recognize that there are a lot of fools, uh, take care that you are not one. <laughs> uh, go through those necessary channels to make sure that you're not being a fool. Uh, do you actually understand the things you're talking about? Uh, do you actually understand the arguments that you're making? Do you understand what the other side is saying? Uh, a very common tactic in our day and age is to just label anybody that disagrees with me as uh, stupid or evil, right? Uh, because if you're stupid and evil, then I don't have to think about what you're saying, right? I don't have to consider your points. Uh, again, this is a foolish way to live. Uh, we want to think through uh, what, what is being said to us. We want to understand. Uh, we want to take care that we are not fools. Um, next, I had to put my favorite two uh, Proverbs uh, <laughs> uh, up here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Uh, here, I, I just love that... Uh, God chooses to put these two uh, contradictory <laughs> uh, Proverbs right next to each other. But again, uh, Proverbs is giving us wisdom for life. Uh, and if you're wise, uh, you'll know that uh, life has no one-size-fits-all solutions, right? Uh, the things that worked in a given situation may not necessarily work in the next situation, right? Uh, you kind of have to take things uh, a day at a time. You have to gauge and, and figure out, think through every single situation. Uh, so it is with uh, talking to a fool, right? So if you're talking, if you hear somebody uh, talking, whether it's about politics or anything else, if you hear somebody saying something that you know is just absolute foolishness, uh, you have to kind of gauge, is this somebody that I can have a valuable conversation with? Can I talk with this person and get to some kind of truth with this person? Uh, or is it going to devolve into a shouting match, right? Um, the uh, the older generation, they grew up with the, uh, with the general wisdom of never talk about religion or politics. Um, and the reason they did that is because they recognized that can very easily become a shouting match. Uh, however, if you, if, if the truth keeps silent, uh, then lies are going to have their, their way, right? If wisdom doesn't say anything, then foolishness is going to keep on blabbing, right? And everybody's going to jump on the foolishness. Um, everybody's going to accept the foolishness. Uh, so we need to talk, uh, but we also have to choose our battles, uh, figure out when it's valuable to talk when it's not. Um, Next point, carefully seek and guard the truth, right? Uh, as Christians, God uh, absolutely tasks us with speaking what is true. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. First uh, John chapter one uh, says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Uh, again, our modern politics uh, relies quite a lot on darkness, quite a lot on people not knowing what they're talking about, quite a lot on people not remembering what happened a few months back. Um, people rely on uh, uh, people only listening to their side of the story and not getting a full picture of things, right? Uh, especially today, there's a lot of lies, a lot of deception. Uh, so you need to be on guard against that. Um, you need to make sure that you're pursuing what is true. Um, you want to be careful about deceptively edited videos, uh, deceptively worded headlines. Uh, you have to be careful. Even some of the fact checkers that we have uh, have been found lying. Uh, so you want to be able to verify those things. Uh, you want to be uh, aware that your favorite politician or your favorite news sources very well could be lying to you about things. Uh, so pay attention when you listen to critiques uh, of those things. Uh, I know there are a lot of um, uh, news outlets and uh um, programs uh, these days that are uh, making an effort to help people to think through both sides of a story. Um, I know there are some uh, um, groups that will help you to see, okay, there's this new, there's this story in the news. Here's how the left is talking about it. Here's how the right is talking about it. Um, and that can give you a little bit more of a even understanding about what's going on. Uh, that can be a very valuable thing for making sure that you're not just getting one side of the story or uh, having things uh, kind of flipped and twisted uh, to, to, uh, manipulate you in one direction or another. Um, another thing to be on guard against um, is uh, the rhetoric uh, that we that we uh, use in our political speech, right? I said before that uh, very often we will uh, think of politics, uh, we'll talk about politics with religious terms, right? Like it's good versus evil, right? Uh, rather than different policies, right? Um, it's, it's really important for us to not get sucked in to those uh, kinds of things, right? Uh, we can very easily fall into this mentality of, well, because my side is good, it's okay if I ignore um, the, the evils of my side, 
right? Because we're the good guys. So we can ignore what's going wrong on our side. And we're not going to call out the corruption on our, our end, right? While we fixate on the other side. Uh, again, uh, the, the, we're all sinful people, right? And so we do need to be able to gauge with our own sins on our side. Uh, and we also need to be able to recognize the goods and the virtues of the other side, right? Uh, if, if we have this very simplified, I'm good, everybody else is evil mentality, again, that's just going to be foolishness. And we're going to be blinded to a lot of uh, what is going on. Um, in addition, also just recognize that uh, with that uh, political rhetoric, um, very often, again, people are, are going to say things and do things that they really do not mean, <laughs> right? Um, but often we get kind of sucked into thinking that. Um, so for example, uh, uh, just in the current race, um, well, current and last race, um, uh, we had uh, Harris was the vice president or is the vice president of uh, Joe Biden. Uh, but before when she was running against him in the primary, she accused him of being a racist, right? Uh, but now she's his VP, Apparently, she, apparently she's either she's OK with working for a racist uh, or she didn't wasn't actually serious in the same way. Uh, Donald Trump, his VP right now is uh, J.D. Vance. Uh, Vance had previously accused Donald Trump of being Hitler. Right. Uh, again, is he OK working for Hitler now? <laughs> uh, again, people talk in these uh, very high emotion intensity ways, uh, but they don't ultimately mean that. Right. Um, and so, again, people are, are, especially our politicians, are very interested in flip-flopping uh, when they have uh, something to be gained by that. Uh, they're very interested in not uh, standing by their words, right? And so we have to be aware of that, right? We can't uh, fall into the, the idea of, well, my guy always tells the truth. Not so much. You're generally not going to find that uh, in any in any side. Um, continuing on, uh, glorify God in your political speech, Um this is a, a huge one. A lot of uh, our political speech has just embraced slander. Uh, and this is not good for us as Christians. Uh, so James chapter one, uh, just a couple of verses from here, uh, starting verses 19 and 20. There it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Jump ahead to verse uh, 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from becoming, uh, from being polluted by the world. Uh, once again, uh, as you're practicing politics, uh, especially as you're talking with other people about your political beliefs and ideas, uh, the first thing that we want to be practicing is listening. We need to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Uh, if I don't actually know who you are, if I don't actually know where you're coming from, I can't really effectively, effectively explain uh, these things to you, right? Uh, I need to be able to understand who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, in a similar way, uh, as you're having a political conversation, uh, you need to practice patience. Uh, again, this we, we already talked about this, that a lot of these conversations can uh, devolve into shouting matches. Uh, as a Christian, you don't get to do that. <laughs> uh, you want to keep a tight rein on your tongue. You want to be careful how you speak. Uh, and you especially want to be careful that you're angry. Uh, again, uh, if you're a Christian, how when was the last time you uh, uh, got angry and then went on to praise God, right? Went on to do something that uh, you were really proud of, right? Uh, it's not a very common thing, right? Uh, so we want to be very careful, uh, make sure that we're in control of ourselves. And yeah, as you're having a conversation, you're going to have a much more productive conversation if you can keep cool, uh, if you can keep calm, uh, if you can speak in a way that is winsome uh, rather than uh, flying off the handle, right? Uh, so uh, seeking first to understand, making sure you do understand where the other person is coming from, um, that can be a really valuable thing. Um, one uh, psychologist suggested uh, before you uh, say your your piece, make sure that you can are accurately uh, say back to the other person what they are thinking, what they are feeling. Right. Uh, and if, if you can say it in such a way that they say, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say, uh, then I then again, you, you know that you're understood, you know, that they or they know that you uh, understood them uh, and then you can more effectively talk there. Um, uh, the, the biblical mandate for us as Christians is to speak the truth in love. OK, uh, I'm not loving anybody if I'm lying to them uh, and I'm not uh, uh, loving anybody if I'm just being a jerk because I'm just I'm just going to tell the truth. I'm just going to tell it like it is and be horrible to everybody. Right. Uh, we are to walk that balance of speaking the truth in love. Right. That's what we need to do. Uh, again, just because our country uh, is all about political slander uh, doesn't mean we should be. OK, we've got to rise above that. We got to do better than that.
Um, now, again, there, there is an interesting uh, difficulty here, right? Um, because, for example, uh, this actually happened uh, in, in some of the small towns around me. Uh, there was a person running for office, uh, but they had kind of a scandalous past. Uh, uh, they had done some things in the past that uh, sort of disqualified them from running for this office. Uh, so we had this discussion of, OK, is it slander to tell people about this person's past, right? Um, so if in a situation like that, you want to think through uh, two major things. First off, is the true is the story true? OK, is what happened true? Like I said, there's a lot of lies and everything. You want to make sure that what you're talking about actually is true. Uh, secondly, uh, you want to think through, is it good for me? Is it beneficial for me to share uh, this this news about what this person has done? Uh, in, in some cases, right? Uh, again, if uh, some scoundrel is going to get into office uh, that, that really shouldn't be in that office, there is a place for that. Uh, but I, again, I want to be very careful that I'm not just trying to puff myself up in pride or, or something like that. Uh, so again, it can be a difficult balance to maintain, uh, but God wants us to, to aim for that proper balance. Um, last thing I wanted us to think about is just understanding the political game. Uh, understand what politics is. Um, Psalm 146, uh, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Romans 3, uh, not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. I already talked about the vice president situation, right? Um, again, a lot of uh, political enthusiasts like to paint their uh, efforts as spiritual battles of good versus uh, evil uh, or uh, people that lose elections. They, they'll sometimes just brag, well, I was being true to my uh, beliefs and that kind of thing. Uh, but again, as we're thinking through what God has designed politics to do, as we're aiming to understand uh, what its function is, uh, we want to be very clear with ourselves about what our goals are in politics, right? Uh, by nature, because uh, politics is a group activity, uh, it requires a lot of compromise. Uh, you're not going to get uh, the perfect government that you want. You're not going to get the perfect candidate that you want. Uh, so in any situation, you got to compromise. Uh, you got to uh, you got to choose, okay, this person is strong, maybe on, I don't know, foreign policy or something. They're kind of weak on the economy. So whatever, uh, we'll, we'll have to figure that out. Which which do I actually want more, right? Um, and so you have to be uh, able to able to work through that. Uh, you have to work or be, be uh, on guard against the rhetoric of how people talk. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, again, pursuing the truth, that you understand uh, who <laughs> this give, a given person is, right? Um, we want to ex expect over-the-top descriptions of every situation. We want to expect the outrage culture, uh, but we not we do not want to be uh, taken in by these things. Uh, we want to be able to think clearly. Uh, so for, again, again, as you're thinking about, okay, who, who should I uh, uh, work with politically or who should I um, uh, support politically, uh, you want to think through, okay, what are my goals within uh, politics, right? What do I actually want to accomplish? What do I think will be good for the nation? Uh, and okay, th then I can think through these, these candidates uh, would fit this uh, place very well. Uh, also, do you understand um, uh, the division of our government, right? Do you understand what a president does? Do you understand what uh, a senator uh, and a house representative does? Um, if, if you don't understand those things, you should really educate yourself, <laughs> right? Um, voting is a responsibility. Uh, and because it's a responsibility, you should know what you're doing, right? Uh, if you if you don't know what you're voting for, you probably shouldn't be voting, right? Uh, you shouldn't be wielding power that you don't understand. Uh, be very careful with that kind of stuff. Um, so again, yeah, as, as we aim to practice politics, yeah, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to uh, what we can accomplish, what government is for, uh, what we can accomplish there. Um, and then also, like we talked about with the design previously, uh, generally, you're going to um, be able to accomplish much more good if you focus on uh, the local level. Uh, so the politics in your own town, uh, in your own city, uh, in your own county, uh, generally, you're going to be able to do a lot more good in that case. Uh, we tend to over fixate on uh, the nation, um, but but generally uh, focusing on your town and your state uh, will be much more fruitful. Uh, you'll be able to do a lot more impact. Plus, you can get involved and actually do a lot of things uh, in your own town, in your own state. Um, so, again, those are all valuable things to, to be going through. Um, that was all I have for you today. I know this was quite a lot. Uh, again, there's a lot of wisdom to be thinking through. So, um, you know, if you do have any other uh, Christian wisdom to share with your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, I'd appreciate that. Throw those in the comments or whatever. Um, but with that, uh, I'll not keep your time any longer. God's richest blessings on you till we meet again.